absolutely thrilled that uh, to uh, help us think deeply about this issue, we have uh, Wade Henderson as our lunchtime keynote speaker, and he will be introduced to you properly in the way that he deserves by Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers. Randy, as you know, um, oversees the 1.5 million member AFT, which represents educators and also, also other public sector professionals. She was, uh, you may not know, a social studies teacher at Clara Barton High School in Brooklyn, New York. Um, she has been in her current role since 2008, in which she has launched education reform efforts, created an AFT innovation fund, uh, led the development of a model to transform teacher evaluations, uh, chaired an AFT committee calling for all prospective teachers to meet a high entry standard as in medicine or law so that they're prepared from day one in the classroom and taken on more other issues than one can take a shake a stick at. Uh, so I'm delighted that she will um, get us rolling on this next part of the conversation with Wade. Thank you. I get to be on a panel later, so this is really an introduction about Wade. <laughs> um, I do want to just say thank you to all of you who are here today. The conversations today have been incredibly rich, and I want to thank, as others have, Linda for um, spearheading and shepherding us to this point. Um, so really, thank you very much, Linda, and thank you, your colleagues at Stanford. Thank you. So. Yes, it would be good to keep clapping. As Becky said earlier, to start, you know, sowing some joy about the stuff that works, actually. So the Leadership Conference and um, the AFT share many common values and priorities. Among them, addressing issues relating to civil and human rights, which to us means working on public education, and making it what it needs to be to be the anchor of democracy, the propeller of economy, and ensuring that, and I'm going to say it, all children not only dream their dreams, but achieve them. But it's not just public education that the Leadership Conference works on, that we work on together, but it's poverty, it's immigration, it's health care, it's worker rights, it's voting rights, it's creating the ladder of opportunity to the middle class again. And so in all of these different walks of life, I've had the pleasure of working with Wade Henderson for many years on, on these issues. For you, those of you who don't know Wade, Wade is the ally you want on your side regardless of what fight you might be working on whether it's opening the doors of opportunity for all children, particularly children who too often have not been well served. Wade's the champion you want to stand with you when you're fighting for equitable resources, whether ensuring teachers are prepared and supported to meet their students' needs or addressing the effects of poverty instead of ignoring them. Wade's light reflects his understanding that education and economic opportunities are inextricably intertwined. America must do in all schools what we do in our best schools, and people already have talked about what we need to do to do that, including re-envisioning our systems of education and our systems of accountability. That doesn't happen, help all kids, all schools. It doesn't happen by chance. It has to happen by right. And that right is supported by high standards for all students with high levels of support. That right is protected by ensuring adequate and equitable resources, including great teachers and compensatory resources where they're needed. That right is honored by preparing all children, all children for a higher education, for high skill, high wage work, and for full participation in civic life. Wade has done so much on so many of these issues. And so, rather than go on and on about how important he is and how important he has been in terms of pulling the labor movement and civil rights movement together, I just want to take a minute to basically say thank you. Thank you for pushing us to the same goals 
pushing against the same foes. Thank you for pushing us, Wade, to be the best we can be to help envision an America that creates a ladder of opportunity for all kids and that reimagines and re-envisions civil rights in a way that embraces everyone. Thank you. Well, wow. Randy, that was a beautiful introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, I have to just acknowledge Randy. First, it was a, a very gracious and generous introduction. Uh, Randy is also a member of my board of directors. So I, I'm privileged to have AFT on the national board of directors of the Leadership Conference. I'm also pleased to have NEA. Uh, I see my uh, buddy Dennis Van Wickel. Uh, here, Dennis is also a board member, distinguished leader, of course, of the National Education Association, and delighted to have you here. And then, certainly last, but by no means least in this uh, scenario, I just want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Tom Sainz. Tom, the president of the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Tom, we love you. Uh, but Tom is also, Tom is also the vice chair of the Leadership Conference, and so I'm really honored time to have you here as well. And I mention them not simply because they are uh, distinguished members of our board, but the Leadership Conference, ladies and gentlemen, is the nation's leading civil and human rights coalition. And we have over 200 national organizations, as we say, working to build an America as good as its ideals. It would be impossible for us to do that without having the leadership and support, certainly of the three individuals I've acknowledged here today, but of the many countless other organizations who are committed to social justice and social change and in creating the more perfect union that we know this country can be. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging dear Linda Darling Hammond and the Stanford Center for Opportunity Policy in Education uh, for inviting me to join you today. Uh, I'm so honored to be asked to give the keynote speech before all of my friends and colleagues in the education advocacy community who are working each and every day to improve the education of millions of American children and thousands of children that may not yet be citizens, but who under Plyler versus Doe deserve every right to be educated in schools as if they were citizens, because we recognize, as the court does, the value of education for all. Now, as you all know, last month, we celebrated the 60th anniversary of the Supreme Court's historic decision in Brown versus the Board of Education, which ended legal segregation of our public schools and helped to galvanize the modern civil and human rights movement of the 20th century. From our vantage point today, America has taken giant steps on our journey toward equality and justice. You know, we're celebrating many anniversaries this year, and I won't belabor too many of them, but it is the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And were it not for that Civil Rights Act, I can assure you that this integrated audience would not be sitting here at the Washington Court Hotel in Washington, D.C., because I grew up here. And I know that D.C. was a segregated southern city, okay? A segregated southern city. And boy, have we changed in the matter of one lifetime in a dramatic way. And that's not enough, but it is significant. I would also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer. 1964, Freedom Summer that led to this powerful transformation and elevation of the right to vote and its importance for American democracy. And it, of course, is to some degree, not overshadowed, but certainly blended with the memories of, of Andrew Goodman, of James Cheney, and of Michael Mickey Schwerner, and their martyrdom. The fact that these young 
activists were killed 50 years ago trying to bring the right to vote to citizens of Mississippi, but by extension to the entire country, is a moment in time that we should not forget. So, uh, you know, we obviously consider the single most important factor in our country the fact that we have ended formal legal segregation, at least in the last half of the 20th century. But today, economic security and upward mobility in America, the opportunity for education and skills needed for 21st century careers, now, we're reminded just how far we still have to go. So I want to thank Linda and her team for pulling this conversation together. And again, I'm honored to be here. Now, this year, as we commemorate Brown, we must also remember the vision that is embedded in the actual text of that decision. And so I'm just going to quote a couple of paragraphs. This is from the Brown decision. It says, today, education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. Compulsory school attendance laws and the great expenditures for education both demonstrate, both demonstrate our recognition of the importance of education to our democratic society. It is required in the performance of our most basic public responsibilities, even service in the armed forces. It is the very foundation of good citizenship. Today, it is a principal instrument in awakening the child to cultural values, in preparing him for later professional training, and in helping her to adjust normally to her environment. In these days, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. Such an opportunity where the state has undertaken to provide it is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. Now, this is as bold a statement of purpose as we have in the United States. But the truth of the last 60 years is that despite the progress made after Brown, it is impossible to claim that we have fully realized the promise of a high quality public education available to all children on equal terms. And we certainly can't claim victory when black and Latino students graduate high school at a lower rate than their white counterparts, and when they drop out at far higher rates. Our schools are still far too segregated by race and by class. In fact, the typical black or Latino student attends a school where nearly 60% of the students are low income, where by nearly every measure, they are receiving a substandard education. Six decades after Brown, millions of black and brown young people have been offered little better than a school system that is separate, unequal, and inadequate to meet the demands of the 21st century economy. And as you well know, often their school districts are surrounded by whiter, wealthier suburbs where local property taxes can purchase resources that poor districts simply cannot afford like better compensation and working conditions for teachers, manageable class sizes, school nurses and counselors, state-of-the-art technology, and the full suite of college preparatory classes. And yet, an education is more important now than ever before. Now, when Brown was decided almost 60 years ago, there were good-paying, family-supporting jobs for workers without formal educational credentials. But the era of pick and shovel jobs is long gone. Guys, I repeat, the era of pick and shovel jobs is behind us, is no more. So those who would support themselves in the 21st century need a high school diploma and more. They need career training, an associate degree, or ideally a four-year college degree. And that is why a stronger focus on science Technology, engineering, and math, often called STEM, is an important piece of our advocacy for greater educational opportunity. 
STEM education can provide these historically underrepresented populations with proven pathways for obtaining good jobs and a higher standard of living. Today, only 2.2% of Latinos, 2.7% of African Americans, and 3.3% of Native Americans and Alaska Natives have earned a first university degree in the natural sciences or engineering by age 24. Women make up the majority of students on college campuses today, and about 46% of the workforce. But they represent less than 20% of bachelor's degree recipients in fields like computer science and engineering, and hold less than 25% of STEM jobs. So it's time for the nation to examine where and how we are losing so many children along the K to 16 STEM pipeline and to accelerate progress in closing both opportunity and achievement gaps that persist. We must examine what systemic changes are necessary to ensuring that STEM learning is inclusive, engaging, and equally accessible so that all of our children have the same opportunities to adequately prepare for college and for careers that will allow them to support themselves and their families. Now, I also believe this is where the Common Core state standards are critical as a pathway to prepare our young people for college or careers that pay good living wages. The Common Core, if implemented properly, and equitably could revolutionize education in America and start us on a path toward truly meeting the promise of Brown. The resistance to Common Core is not unexpected. The Common Core is the single most significant change to our education system since we started desegregating schools in earnest in the, la in the uh, 1960s, late 1960s. Now, such a radical shift is bound to concern some people. And, and while that concern from folks across the political spectrum is understandable, our support for higher standards as a civil rights goal must be unwavering. And we have to be much more uh, vocal about why we support our Common Core standards. We must explain how we think equitable implementation of Common Core could drive change around the resource equity issue that we've long championed. And we cannot settle for the status quo when to just take a, a couple of examples from the Department of Education's civil rights data collection. I mean, this is what the status quo is right now. Black, Latino, American Indian, and Native American students attend schools with higher concentration of first-year teachers at a higher rate than white students. It's not simply that they're first-year teachers. Obviously, they can be wonderfully enthusiastic and very competent. But the challenge of manning, uh, managing a diverse class as a new teacher is something that often comes with training and experience over time. Schools with some of the poorest students Students who have the least opportunities and advantages often need the most seasoned teachers in order to really do as well as their potential would suggest. Black students are more than four times likely, and Latino students are twice as likely to attend schools with a high concentration of uncertified and unlicensed teachers than white students. My friend Dennis Van Roykel talked about the importance of licensure. Well, if you use that as a standard, and certainly there is validity in your assessment, Dennis, then how can we justify giving a majority of poor students who really need the strongest, most accountable teachers, teachers who are unlicensed and inexperienced and who are armed only with their enthusiasm and their commitment to their students? That's great, but that's not enough. It's great, but it's not enough. So, to have black and Latino students represent just 26% of students enrolled in gifted and talented education programs, despite making up 40% of the students attending schools that offer these programs, something is wrong. A quarter of high schools with the highest percentage of black and Latino students do not, I repeat, 
do not offer Algebra II. A third of these schools do not offer chemistry. 11 states, 11 states, including Kansas, where Brown versus the Board of Education began, have no black or Latino students in advanced placement computer science courses. So I mean, what are you talking about? I mean, you're talking about states that are prepared for failure in the 21st century because they have a diverse population that they can't draw upon to educate their population. You know, I talked to a colleague, I'm digressing from my remarks for a minute. I, I talked to a colleague who it works for Comcast in Pennsylvania. Comcast, one of the big, as you know, uh, commercial cable companies and one of the largest employers in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia. Comcast is building a new tower for employees. They'll house about 2,000 new employees. And I said to my colleague, well, look, and where are you going to get them from? You're not getting them from the Philadelphia school system, not given the fact that they're not taking courses that would be minimally required to fill the jobs that you will have available to you. So what are you going to do? And the response was, well, we're going to work in improving the schools. And it's our responsibility, just as it is the responsibility of parents, just as it is the responsibility of state officials. And I was encouraged by that. So we have to be deeply involved in ensuring that the implementation of Common Core promotes equity and doesn't leave behind students who are already undereducated and underserved by the system. The very fact that Common Core is such a revolutionary change to our system only makes the need to make resource equity a reality even more apparent. Now, the argument is simple, right? Uh, if states are going to raise standards, they must provide the instruction and support that each and every student needs to meet those standards. That means we need teachers who are trained to teach the new standards and to have the support and resources they need to succeed. That, all, that also means ensuring outstanding teachers and up-to-date learning resources are available for low-income and minority students, students with disabilities, and English language learners, not just for wealthy kids. And, you know, uh, the Gates Foundation, as you probably know, announced yesterday that it was recommending to some states that it consider deferring tests with high impact, testing teachers on their skills for a couple of years to give those schools and systems an opportunity to catch up. And, and that may well be a good thing in that you don't want to rush the implementation of these high uh, stakes tests without giving the school systems and the teachers an opportunity to prepare. There's an equal concern on the other side, though, where schools have begun making progress. You don't want them to back off under the argument that, well, we have a little more time to get it right. You want them to follow up in a conscientious way, but you want to make certain that every school system is given the opportunity to prepare its teaching faculty in ways that will make them successful and thus make the students successful. Now, I have to say, I did note the irony of sort of seeing the paper this morning with the Gates Foundation announcement and then reading another article about the Vergara decision in California. Okay? Uh, you know a state superior court a ruled that teacher tenure and I believe it was framed as constant unconstitutional. I, I'm not sure what that means. I haven't read the decision. Obviously, I don't want to speak to the substance of it. But I will make this observation. You know, you don't necessarily, in fact, you don't at all, promote the best interests of students by deciding that the way to do it is eliminating protections that all workers should have. Now, I'm not speaking to the ultimate substance of the decision. But what I am saying is this. Too often, teachers are scapegoated for the failures of a system that are shortchanged. They are. They are. They are. And while I think teachers have a great responsibility, I'm not for demonizing them 
in the name of, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, short-term uh, efforts uh, to identify resources that don't really address the long-term substantive problem. So we are going to take a look at that. Obviously, I need to study this issue more closely. But I'm deeply troubled at this notion that somehow you build a good system on the backs of the workers who give the most and trying to make it a good system. So I think it's worth looking at. And I think, you know, doing anything less than trying to implement Common Core in a thoughtful way, but at the same time driving change, if we don't do that, then we have missed one of the great opportunities of our time to make the next leap forward in providing quality education. And so, and though the 60th anniversary of Brown provides an opportunity to assess where we stand, where we need to go, we cannot place the entire civil rights education agenda on its shoulders. Brown was never intended to do all of that. Uh, frankly, they are not broad enough to bear that weight. Another decision by the Supreme Court about 40 years ago, though, is worth noting, and that was the decision in San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez. It cast a long shadow, probably even a longer shadow, over the ability to provide educational equity, even than Brown. Uh, while the nation worked, often begrudgingly, to desegregate the federal role in ensuring quality education for all students, that it was critically wounded in 1973 with the Rodriguez decision. Here, the court decided that the state school finance systems, based largely on local property taxes, are not unconstitutional under federal law. Uh, despite the fact that uh, these systems resulted in gross inequities. In essence, the nation's highest court ruled that the opportunity for a quality public education is not a fundamental constitutional right. Imagine my shock as a law student when I realized, oh my God, there is no fundamental right to a quality education here in the United States. That's one of the reasons, by the way, the Leadership Conference changed its name about four or five years ago to the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, because we're not going to allow the Constitution, though we value it and, and lift it up, to define what should be basic human rights. And we incorporate human rights in our name because we believe, we believe that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is also an element to be taken into account in deciding how we respond to some of the challenges of our time. Now, in essence, the highest court ruled that the opportunity, as I mentioned, is not a fundamental constitutional right. It hampered our ability to improve education for millions of students of color and low-income students, students with disabilities and those English language learners. Four decades after Rodriguez, the ruling has been nothing less than a license for states and localities to perpetuate the inequalities of opportunity and outcomes that have hobbled American democracy from generation to generation. And without federal resources due to the Rodriguez decision, all challenges to school finance systems have been remanded to the states, often resulting in fractured, drawn out, and expensive litigation. Now, even though heroic litigators committed to educational opportunity, when great decisions in support of greater financial equity, governors and legislatures more times than not, often refuse to comply with their own state court's decisions. Now take, for instance, Kansas, where Brown uh, was decided uh, more than a half century ago. The state courts determined, based in part on the legislature's own findings on what resources are necessary to educate a student in Kansas, that the school system was grossly underfunded. To remedy this, the court ordered funding increases to the tune of $440 million. The legislature refused and even considered stripping the court of its jurisdiction in school finance cases. Don't like what the court said? Take the jurisdiction away and just prohibit them from making any decisions in this area. And then Governor Sam Brownback, someone we knew when he was in the Senate representing Kansas, a decent guy, he had cut taxes so much that he claimed that Kansas simply couldn't afford to adequately fund its schools. Now, you can't have it both ways. You can't set up a tax cut that is so devastating it strips all available resources out of your uh, school bu uh, your budget and then argue you don't have enough in your budget to fund the schools. 
<laughs> the court was unimpressed with this warped logic and maintained <laughs> that the school system must be fully funded. Instead of complying with the court, the governor sought mediation, which was unsuccessful, and then appealed the decision to the Kansas Supreme Court that ruled in March that the current funding levels violated the state constitution and set a deadline for July 1st for Kansas legislature, the Kansas legislature and the executive branch to agree on a way to fully fund, fully and equitably fund all of Kansas schools. So we could also take Pennsylvania, where the Philadelphia school district, the eighth largest in the nation, opened last September after making drastic budget cuts that included closing nearly two dozen public schools and dismissing nearly a thousand teachers and nearly all school counselors and many other essential staff. Now, more than 137,000 students showed up for the first day of school without the resources like nurses and counselors that are critical to providing the kind of educational environment that students need. Now, shamefully, it took the tragic death of a young girl and the national spotlight that civil and human rights organizations, including the NAACP and the National Urban League, the League of United Latin American Citizens, the Education Law Center, the Southeast Asia Resource Center, and the Leadership Conference, took all of us to put on uh, the spotlight on Governor Tom Corbett to get him to release $45 million that he had impounded and that had been previously allocated to the school district. Now these are nearly, and these are only two examples, but we continue to fight these battles. We've also had some successes. I won't belabor those, but I think you can talk about New Jersey or Colorado or North Carolina as places where we've had some success and maybe in a Q&A I can go over that. Uh, but the truth is that it's not sufficient, guys. Uh, 60 years after Brown, more than 40 years after Rodriguez, we cannot keep fighting state by state, case by case strategies that don't eventually make their way to the Supreme Court to revisit Rodriguez and establish a clear constitutional right to a public education. And so we in the community have to look at ways of trying to meet those challenges and if that includes putting together in a systematic way a program that allows the court to revisit Rodriguez, then that's a goal that we have to consider. Now, we are in the midst of a passionate, vibrant debate over Common Core that is about the future of education, the role that government has, and the role, rather, that government has in ensuring equitable access to education, and perhaps most importantly for this conversation, how to hold everyone involved in the education system accountable. It's what my friend Randy Weingarten calls the 360 degree accountability for providing the very best education that we can for every child, regardless of their race or ethnicity, or for that matter, their zip code. Now, make no mistake, the debate is truly about whether or not the most economically powerful and diverse nation on the planet has the public and political will to truly make educational opportunity for all, a living reality, and not just a promise on paper. We need a 21st century education system for a 21st century global economy. And in order to get that system, we need to build the public and political will to make necessary investments. In a universal high quality preschool, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, expanded learning time, and most urgently, the common core state standards that will ensure educational opportunity for all. And to do that, we have to help Americans to radically rethink our collective commitment to each and every child's success. So what this conversation has done, as I wrap up, and I appreciate it, Kim, as this conversation has done, focusing attention on accountability bringing together a discussion of how we make funding for high quality education more equitable, and talking about the implementation of common core standards as a vehicle for that change, has presented educational advocates with the closest thing we've come to a harmonic convergence in quite a while. We have a chance, guys, 
to use our skills, our voices, our advocacy, to pressure the system to work, not against itself, but to work in perfecting our vision of what this country can be. And it's that vision that will sustain us over time and achieve the America we all want. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you. Today.